Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Museum special Stay Connected Facebook Live series. I'm historian Edna Friedberg. Our museum remains closed, as does much of the country and much of the world, in fact, but learning about the Holocaust doesn't have to stop. So we are instead coming to you live from our homes, and we thank you in advance for your patience if we experience any technical glitches while we stream from a distance. People around the world are grappling with the challenges of coronavirus, and so we are bringing you stories of resilience, of courage, of generosity. In the United States, this is Teacher Appreciation Week, and today we will share stories from the era of the Holocaust of teachers and students who defied the odds and continued to educate, to learn, to uh, engage and inspire each other under extremely dangerous conditions. Our guest today is Kim Levins Releva, a teacher educator for the museum. Hi, Kim. Hi, good morning from Nashville, Tennessee. It's nice to see you, although I miss seeing you in the office. Me too. Uh, prior to joining the museum, Kim taught history and English for 17 years in both middle school and at the community college level. Now, in her role as a museum educator, she supports and coaches teachers around the country to integrate Holocaust history into their work including how to adapt to the new teaching conditions of the pandemic. During today's show, please post your questions in the comments section and Kim and I will get to as many of them as we can. Um, let's begin, Kim. Teaching is always difficult during times of political turmoil or violence. And during the Holocaust, teaching Jewish children was at times illegal and dangerous. Can you uh, help our visitors, our viewers, to understand what it was like to be a teacher in Germany during the early first years of the Nazi regime in the 1930s? Sure. Well, after Hitler was appointed chancellor in January of 1933, the Nazis sought to coordinate all aspects of German society. Um, this applied to all institutions, including schools. Um, the Nazis placed a special value on the indoctrination of the youth and they changed school curriculums to be a vehicle for Nazi propaganda. Um, teachers were required to swear an oath of loyalty to Hitler. Uh, the um, schools became very rigid, very dogmatic. And we actually have a clip from a propaganda film of what an ideal German classroom would look like during the Nazi regime. All right, let's have a look at this propaganda clip. Now this staged clip, uh, as you mentioned from a propaganda film is the perfect example of what the Nazis called, as you said, coordination. They wanted everything to align in society in support of their vision. What happened to teachers in Germany who didn't want to allow their classrooms to become vehicles for doc indoctrination of students? Well, they lost their jobs. Many were fired because of their political beliefs or their refusal to take the oath. About a third of German teachers were fired because they were Jewish. There were prominent scientists that left their positions, most notably Albert Einstein, who came to the United States in March of 1933, after the Nazis targeted him for being Jewish and for his political beliefs as well. And by 1936, Jewish teachers were not allowed to teach in German public schools at all. When you mention an oath, you mean an oath of loyalty to Hitler? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like uh, to now take a question that has come in actually from a student uh, from my home state of Illinois, um, from Kewanee, Illinois, a seventh grader at Art Central School named JC Hinton asks, in what ways were Jewish students dehumanized? Could you talk a little about that, please? Sure. The environment for Jewish children at this time was incredibly difficult. They were taunted by their classmates and their teachers alike. Their rights were restricted. They were not able to do the same thing as their German peers, making them feel increasingly on the margins and the outcasts of society. And by 1938, Jewish children were forbidden for attending German public schools, and they were forced into Jewish-only schools. 
eventually even those schools were closed to children. And they either had to immigrate to other countries or they were um, sent to labor or concentration camps in Nazi controlled Europe. It was a very difficult for Jewish children. And I know we have in the museum's collections, um, oral history testimonies from survivors talking about ways that they were physically attacked, beaten up by their classmates, um, humiliated by their teachers, brought to the front of the room and used as literal examples of their physical, supposed physical inferiority. So it was um, a, quite a vulnerable feeling for Jewish students in Germany. Um, let's talk about then, you mentioned that once Jewish children were being, or Jewish students were being forced out of schools or increasingly made to feel uncomfortable there, uh, the Jewish community uh, in Germany made efforts to find alternatives for educating their youth. Um, please tell us about one, an instructor at one of these settings, a man named Dr. Kurt Bondi. Yes, before the Nazi regime, uh, Dr. Kurt Bondi was a professor of law in Hamburg, Germany. And he was quite an innovative thinker. He was an expert in social psychology and social wel welfare, and he studied education. He worked with, extensively with juvenile offenders. It was this background, this innovative background that he had that caused him to be hired to run the Gross Brazen Agricultural Training Center, despite the fact he actually didn't have farming experience himself. And uh, what was Gross Brazen? We're seeing here a photograph of Dr. Bondi in the middle. Uh, looks like aboard some kind of plow or tiller. Uh, having grown up in central Illinois, that's about the extent of my agricultural knowledge. But um, what, how many students were there and what did they learn at Gross Brazen? Well, there were about 240 Jewish students at Gross Brazen and it was a 500 acre residential training farm and school. And it was near Breslau, Germany. It was established by the Central Association of German Jews to teach Jewish youth life skills particularly agricultural skills. They wanted to equip these students with skills that would help them immigrate to other countries that were looking for skilled agricultural labor. And um, what other kinds of uh, things was Dr. Bondi trying to instill in this community? Really, it was an isolated special community, this boarding school. For sure. he, again, he had a very innovative approach to education for the time. He really viewed young adult students as responsible, trustworthy, that they were valuable human beings. And he balanced a strong sense of order and the hard farm work that they did on the land with cultural activities. They had music concerts almost every night. They studied history. They studied foreign languages to prepare them for immigration. They valued teamwork. There was a sense of everyone should take responsibility for their own actions, but also work towards a greater good. Again, he had a very open-minded attitude for the time and his farm really became a haven for Jewish students, especially as life became increasingly more difficult for them in Nazi Germany. And listening to you, I think um, your words can resonate with many of us who've had teachers who've had a profound influence on us or on children around us that goes far beyond any um, just pedagogical experience or knowledge, but that, that teachers are also responsible for the social and emotional well-being of their students. And this Gross Brazen um, Agricultural Boarding School really offered a quite literal refuge. Um, I'm assuming though it could not keep operating as the, the war progressed. What happened to Dr. Bondi and to his students? Well, unfortunately, Dr. Bondi and the male students and staff of the school were arrested and taken to Buchenwald concentration camp on November 9th, 1938. That was Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, a night of organized violence against Jews half of his students were murdered in the Holocaust. But survivors of Gross Brazen went all across the world. Some went to Palestine, they went to Australia, Kenya, um, England, and Argentina. Some fought for the Allies on the Allied side during the Second World War. And about 30 of the Gross Brazen students made it to the United States, where they worked on a communal farm near Burkeville, Virginia. Dr. Brody himself managed to flee to Holland and then he made it to the United States as well, where he wound up being a professor of psychology at the College of William and Mary. Yeah, so just a couple hours south of, of us here, or of me in Washington, I guess you're not here right now. Um, but really an extraordinary story of uh, a community, a family of sorts under great hardship that uh, found ways to buoy each other up. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers to please post your questions in the comments. We'd also like to know where you're watching from and know what our little mini community right now is. Um, we've been talking so far, Kim, about 
um, pre-war Germany. So from 1933 to 1939, these are domestic persecution of Jews happening within a legal framework, as offensive as it might sound, these were laws. Um, of course, all of this changes in September 1939 with the German invasion of Poland and the start of World War II. Uh, millions more Jews fall under German control and anti-Semitic restrictions. And I'd like us to turn to a story of a, a truly astonishing and uh, inspiring teacher in wartime Belgium. Um, tell us about a, a young woman, really very young, named Jean Damant. Yes, Jean, Jean Demont's story is extraordinary. She was a Catholic Belgium teacher, and she was only 21 years old when the Germans invaded Belgium in May of 1940. Here's a nice picture of her. Jean chose to quit her job teaching rather than teach the Nazi propaganda that was then imposed on Belgium schools. But she was asked by a Jewish friend of hers to join the staff of a Jewish school when students, Jewish students were expelled from Belgium public schools. And she accepted the position. Eventually, Jean became principal of the school. And she saw as life became increasingly more dangerous for, Jewish, for Jews in Belgium, she watched as every day the attendance at her school began to fall. And Jean knew this was because her students and her families were being rounded up and deported. And even though she has shown from the outset, uh, as you said, at a very young age, 21 years old, um, her, her uh, opposition to the Nazi occupation, to their ideology, there was one event that was a particular turning point for her. Uh, tell us about that, please. Yes, one day the Gestapo came to her school and asked for three of her students by name. Jean had a difficult decision. She knew she had 60 other students at the school she needed or wanted to protect, so she let them go. Um, she wrote about this in her diary. She wrote that she dressed them herself, that she put them on the truck herself. The youngest child is only three and a half years old. She did all this herself to delay the time when the Nazis would actually have their hands on her children. And she watched them take the children away. It was, it was devastating for her. She found out the children were being used as bait to lure out their parents who were in hiding. Mm -hmm. And indeed the families were captured and likely deported to killing centers. When Jean heard this news, she also wrote about it in her diary. It was a big turning point in her life. She wrote, I was anti-Nazi anti before by conviction. Now she wanted to strike back against them herself to damage them. Because of this trauma, of children who she felt attached to, responsible for, and she couldn't protect them, and they were um, used. Um, really devastating, and I also know that we have this diary entries uh, because her husband uh, later donated her diary, and we have it in our collections. Um, I have a long list here, and I want to give a shout out to viewers who are watching from quite literally all over the world. Thank you for joining us from the Philippines, from South Florida, from Sydney, Australia, from Phoenix, Arizona, from Philadelphia, from Brazil, from North Carolina, from the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh, from Omaha, New York City, from the Voices of Hope and the Hero Center in Connecticut, from the Holocaust Commission in Virginia Beach, Melbourne, Australia, White Rock, British Columbia, Portugal, Kentucky, Chicago. There are a lot of you watching. We are really glad to have you here please do send us your questions. Uh, we also have a comment from a teacher, Mark Nelson, saying, my students and I are so grateful for your museum's powerful advocacy for remembering and preventing genocide. Thank you, Mark. Um, it is really our honor to do this work, and we are really glad to hear from you and to uh, support your teaching during this time of social distancing. Um, so to return to that incredibly painful story that you just described to us, Kim, um, that was a turning point for, for Jean. Uh, what did she do after that? Well, it inspired Jean to take um, a different role. She began to work with the Belgium and Jewish undergrounds to find hiding places for her students. And she uh, used the underground network to find new identities and get false papers for her students. Even the teachers would rehearse with the ch children for hours the details of their new identities, very young children, and stress the absolute importance that they could never get a detail wrong. Uh, Jean found false identity papers. She found race ration cards for them. And then she also worked with the resistance to search for the people who were finding Jews and hiding and denouncing them to the Gestapo. 
Later in the war, very great personal risk. She actually transported arms on her bicycle for the resistance. And over the course of three years, Jean is credited with saving the lives of over 2,000 Jewish children and many adults. That is really just incomprehensible. Um, that scale of people, the range of activities to remember that she's in her early 20s at the time and had uh, the strength of her convictions and that courage. I know it's far beyond what I know I could do, what I think most of us could do. And um, her, the result was amazing. Um, thankfully, uh, she survived um, despite engaging in this absolutely life-threatening work for several years. What happened to Jean after the war? Well, as the war ends, she um, stays and helps her do, helps Jewish children who are now orphans find families. She helps care for children who are returning from camps as well. But by 1946, she comes to the United States where she marries a former fighter in the Italian resistance. For her efforts for saving Jewish children, she is recognized by the state of Israel as righteous among the nations. We read about in our collections, again, her story is just extraordinary, very humble, very down to earth, honest woman. And we will post links in the comments section if people come back later or if you're sharing this episode with friends uh, where you can learn more about Jean's incredible story and the ability of one person to make an immeasurable impact on the lives of others. Um, I also wanted to offer um, a little point of uh, expansion or clarity for people who are watching and may not have been clear about the practice that you were describing, Kim, that uh, these were for children with false identities. These were Jewish children who are given Christian identities and they're practicing them because they have to hide in plain sight, act as though they are this child instead of the child in fact, they were. So answer to a different name, pretend their parents are someone else, a different age, um, an, an incredible pressure to put on uh, an adult, much less um, a kid. Um, that actually makes a, a perfect uh, segue to another question coming again from Central School in Kewanee, Illinois. Uh, shout out to that seventh grade class. Um, a student named Alana Gould is asking, how did Jewish students cope with the psychological stress they were subjected to? every day. Do you have some thoughts on that? Of course, it's very difficult for children under extreme traumatic conditions. And a lot of a lot of kids wrote diaries. We'll talk about that later in the show that we do have a lot of diaries in our collections that tell the story of what was happening. That was a place that mm -hmm. they could um, get their feelings out on paper, but it's, it was very difficult. I mean, these are extreme, extreme conditions, wartime conditions being persecuted is gonna take their toll on children. Um, it's a really, really terrific and complicated question, Alana. One of the other ways, and I'd like us to turn our attention further east um, to German occupied Poland and parts of the occupied Soviet Union to places where hundreds of thousands of Jewish men, women, kids, old people, babies were imprisoned in urban prison zones known as ghettos, um, packed in very tightly to areas without sufficient food, starvation conditions, disease, uh, no hygiene. And yet even there, many, many um, Jewish kids and adults sought to find uh, coping mechanisms through schools, through education, something that could give them a sense of uh, normality, of normal life, of being kids again. Um, could you tell us about one example of uh, this kind of situation, please, Kim, in a ghetto? Yes, we can, we're gonna talk about Charlene Schiff, who I know is you were familiar with, I'm Edna. Um, Charlene and her family lived in Lvov in Eastern Poland, which was occupied by the Soviet Union. And when the Germans invade the Soviet Union in June of 1941, her father is arrested. She never sees him again. But Charlene and her mom, Burma, and her sister are sent, are confined in the Horshoff ghetto. And as um, Edna was saying, conditions in ghettos were terrible. They were places of misery, starvation, overcrowding, and disease. Yet Firma and some of the other women in the ghetto decide to create a school for Charlene and the other children who were too young to work. And they do this at great personal risk because schooling was illegal in the ghetto. And, and can I interrupt a second just to say, we were just seeing a picture of Firma Charlene's mom and her, uh, the girl on the right is her sister, Tahia. Sorry, just before they go away. So. Well, the Firma, her mother, they barter and the other women who are running the school, they barter their jewelry and money for materials to help teach the children in the school for crayons, books, anything that can help provide materials for the children in the ghetto school. 
And this school does provide a place of hope, a little lifeline to normalcy for them while they're confined in the ghetto. Charlene eventually does make it to the United States and she'll talk about it and she talks about her personal testimony, the importance and the impact of the school, how it was a break from the everyday misery, how they could go there and sing songs and be together and just for a moment in time could forget the hardships of her life in the ghetto. Just to be allowed to be a child. Um, and Charlene at this time, and actually uh, Charlene is the, the name that she took when she moved to the United States. Uh, she lived to become uh, a one of our survivor volunteers at the Holocaust Museum, someone who I had the honor and um, pleasure of getting to know her. Uh, here on the left is Charlene, not long after the war as a young woman and on the right um, as an adult. Uh, you can watch testimony from Charlene um, about her life. And in fact, she was the only member of her immediate family to survive the war. Um, her um, mother um, did not survive, her sister did not survive, and Charlene uh, lived actually for several years alone as a, a young girl um, in the woods, a, a truly devastating story. And you have to think that some of her um, inner strength came from uh, the unconditional love and parenting that she received in the, the period right before. So um, really, uh, really quite powerful to think about that kind of spiritual resistance um, in a ghetto. And there were dozens and dozens of such secret schools um, carrying on in ghettos. Um, could you give us an example? You'd mentioned earlier, Kim, about diaries as a way that uh, Jewish young people could kind of keep their sanity. Um, can you give us an example or two? Sure. Um, I think of Kayum Kale. He was a 13 year old boy who was confined in the Wuch ghetto. And he kept a diary. And in the diary, he actually wrote about the impact of a school that he attended in the ghetto. And he wrote that he, he went to school not so much for the lessons, but for the soup and to not be frozen. And these diaries give us a window. They're a first person account of what it was really like to live during the time of the Holocaust. And diaries like Hayim show us that for many, for many young people in the Holocaust, if they were able to have some schooling or normalcy like that, that school is more than, it's more than lessons, it's more than a building. It can be a, a refuge for children. It can be a place where the whole child can be at least nurtured for a moment in time. Yeah, that um, profound grounding influence, especially for kids who are subjected to, to chaos or violence or fear um, in the rest of their lives. Um, we've had a comment come in actually from another one of our survivor volunteers um, dear to all of us, Alfred Munzer, who is a Holocaust survivor from the Netherlands, has written that in his work as a volunteer uh, translating materials for us at the museum, uh, that he translated a, an excerpt from a diary of a young Jewish girl uh, describing the humiliations that non-Jewish students were forced to inflict on their fellow students. And the diary writer here cites a 10-year-old girl named Hedvig Eschen, who refused to participate and confronted the teacher saying, what you are doing is shameful. My Jewish friends are just as good as me. And uh, Al notes that it's an example of a young kid standing up for what is right. And that Hedvig, when she grew to be an adult, went on to fight against apartheid in South Africa. So I think that is just a perfect encapsulation of the fact that children and teenagers have power, they have agency, and that the values and principles that they express, no matter how young they are, um, can shape them um, and drive them for the rest of their lives. Um, again, please post if you have other questions. Um, but now, Kim, um, I have a question because we would remiss not to acknowledge and recognize that we know many of the people who are watching us today are either teachers themselves or parents who have been unexpectedly thrust into the role of educators during this time of physical distancing. I'd like to ask you personally if you could give us a little um, Insider's glimpse into what your work is like now. What are you hearing from teachers and how are you as a museum educator able to support them during this period of um, unprecedented change? Yes, well, teachers are very important to the museum. Education is at the heart of the mission of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And we've just been listening. We've, been, we've tried to provide a space and a community where we can hear from them. First of all, just hear what they're going through just as humans, just as teachers in this time of disruption. And then we're hearing about what they need. It's just difficult. It's difficult to stay in touch with students. It's difficult to pivot on a dime and 
change instruction from in-person to remote. I'm hearing from teachers that they're concerned about their students, that they're reaching out to them first and foremost just to check on them and make sure they're okay and to organize efforts in their community to make sure that students still have food and still have other things that they may need during this time. They're trying their best. They're working so hard. Teachers are working harder than ever. It's definitely not a vacation. Anything to do in the classroom that you try to do online is gonna take twice as much, of, much time. Plus you have the demands of perhaps your own children in the home that you're trying to educate as well. And again, providing a sense of normalcy for, for students during this time, school can do that. And they're all working very hard to make that happen for their students. I'm just inspired and in awe truly of their efforts and the, what they're trying to do at this time. And Kim Later, you better take a look at the comment section. You have a big fan club applauding you and saying how much um, they appreciate being able to lean on you, but also, as you said, the museum functions even in more normal times as a convener for educators from around the world and around the country, some of whom may not have colleagues nearby or mentors nearby, and we aim to uh, create networks of teachers. Um, on a very specific level, uh, before we close, can you suggest if teachers are watching today, um, middle school, high school, whatever level, um, and not just history, but um, English or all, all sorts of subjects, religious schools. If they are watching today and they haven't used our resources before, what are some topics or themes or items that you know that teachers are finding especially resonant or um, productive in this moment? That's where our museum teacher fellows have been so helpful during this time. They've given us suggestions and they've asked specifically for resources to teach an already difficult history at any time made a little more difficult by the fact that they don't have a classroom community to see how students are responding to the material. So we've created some lessons about diaries, about artifacts, about resistance and rescue. They're all available on our website, the ushmm.org website. We have a section called Teach, and we're going in and modifying our lessons, our existing lessons to add recommendations to help make them more friendly for, um, for teachers to use online. It's my full-time job to help teachers. If teachers need help, they can reach out to the museum and we will find a way to do our very best to support them with resources during this time to help them modify their instruction. Great, thank you, Kim. Thank you so much for all the work you are doing. Um, really grateful to have you out there representing and um, boosting morale and offering practical help. So keep it's it up. And it's, good it's an honor to work with teachers. Great. Well, today, um, viewers, you've heard about courageous teachers who transcended tremendous dangers and difficulties, um, obstacles that despite that, they managed to teach, support, and in some cases, even quite literally save the lives of their students during the Holocaust. We share stories like these uh, in tribute to educators uh, who work under all kinds of conditions and also to show the impact of such teachers. We also hope they will provoke two questions for you. What might I have done then? But perhaps more practically, what will I do today? We're glad you joined us and we hope that you will come back again next week, next Wednesday for our next live broadcast on the Stay Connected series on Wednesday, May 13th, once again at 9.30 a.m. Eastern time where we'll be talking about uh, the seminal Holocaust film Shoah, 35 years later, what are some new discoveries we have from material that was left on the cutting room floor? Thank you again for watching us on Facebook Live. Stay healthy, stay safe, and please stay connected. Bye-bye.